Hello, everyone. I am Monica Trasandes, Director of Spanish Language and Latinx Media and Representation at GLAD. My pronouns are she and her. I was born in Uruguay and raised in San Diego. I'm also a novelist and a playwright. So as an activist and a writer, I am doubly excited to introduce you to this amazing panel today. Alphabetically, we have with us today Fernanda or Feru Eguiarte, who is the creator, executive producer, and showrunner of the HBO Max original series Amarres, and the head writer of Ana from Viacom and Pantalla. Also with us is Mariali Rivas, who is a Chilean filmmaker whose award-winning work includes Young and Wild and Princesita. She's also directed for the series La Jauria from Amazon, and she is a Sundance alumni. Tanya Saracho is with us today as well. Tanya is a television writer and playwright who most recently served as creator, showrunner, and executive producer of Vida, the critically acclaimed and, I will say, GLAAD Media Award winning and much nominated uh, show on stars. Marcelo Tovar is also with us today. He is the writer and director, a writer and director whose three films include the award-winning Oso Polar and El Club de los Idealistas, out soon on streaming platforms. His TV script credits include Ana, and he directed the upcoming Amarres for HBO Max. Award-winning Mexican-American writer and filmmaker Moises Zamora is also with us today. Moises is the creator, executive producer, and showrunner of Netflix's Selena the Series. Welcome, welcome, welcome. What a pleasure it is to have you all together here. I have enough questions to take us into February, so let's go. When I think about your work, there's a definite through line there that could be defined as atrevidas, as we say in Uruguay, una manga de atrevidas, which means bold, right? Your characters and your films and your TV shows se atreven. They are bold. They do not acquiesce easily, if at all. Are these your favorite characters and narratives? Please tell us what kinds of stories you love to tell. And we can either go alphabetically, Fernanda, Mariali, Tanya, Marcelo, Moises, or you can just jump in and share your thoughts. Jump in, guys. Peru. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love the characters that I write. I'm like profoundly in love with them. And I, like really, really enjoy to write these chingones characters and these like cabronas characters and these ambitious characters because I really felt that I needed that when I was growing up. But we also need another kind of characters, no? We, we also need to portray this like new era on television by saying, okay, I can be a lesbian who also is like super, super, super mean. <laughs> to my best friend once, no? Because we're not perfect and I really need to build that kind of empathy also. So I try to do that. I try to write characters that are, that are full, full, full of flaws because I really need also to know that you can be a part of this world without being perfect. So that's like the fight I'm fighting in Latam right now <laughs> to have like this amazing, like characters and women and blah, 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 but also letting the public know, know that we can have a lot of different narratives and not only like this chingona and cabrona character. I, I completely agree with, I'm gonna go alphabetically so it's easier. <laughs> I completely agree with what Fernanda said. I It rings uh, close to my heart. And also just to build on that, for me, I grew up on a dictatorship during the 80s, 90s. I was a lesbian. I thought I was a Martian because in, a, in this dictatorship, not lesbians didn't exist. And gay guys were only to diminish. But I remember where I was standing when a song was uh, sounding on the radio and my mom just passed by and said, oh, this is Sandra Mianovich and Celeste Carvalho and they are girlfriends. And I remember feeling like, what? Like the whole floor moved because I thought, oh my God, they are <laughs> girlfriends and they can be girlfriends. And this thing I feel there is someone else out there that is like me. So of course that on time, it made me realize how important representation is. And I agree with Fernanda that it's not only perfect heroines that are gonna beat all odds, uh, but I think 
for me is very important to put on a screen these type of characters, especially for our community and also for girls and boys, because you need to see yourself there. It's a beam of hope and light for everyone, especially for little kids and, and teenagers, mm -hmm. I think. I'm gonna jump the queue. Do it, do it. <laughs> Um, what I'm, uh, I'm gonna jump the line. Um, I, uh, I'm just gonna piggyback off Feru and 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 what just what has been said. Um, I, I, since my theater days, I've, and and now in television, I've been wanting to um, just have complicated, ugly, you know, flaw. It's just a name for flawed, you know, portrayals of who we are. And in the United States, uh, to add the brownness to the queerness is a uh, you know, a, a radical thing. We haven't seen a lot of brown queers, you know, uh, and these, not just on American stages, but uh, in American screens too. So like, but, but, but the desire, and I'm so glad that I was allowed to do that at Stars. it was just to like scratch them up and just complicate them and not um, think about that whole um, likability thing that, you know, but I just make compelling, real grounded people, you know? So um, yeah, that's, that's, um, that's the aim. Well, following the cue, um, <laughs> I, I, you know, when it when it comes to uh, queer characters, I I also like to defend our otherness, you know, because sometimes sometimes it feels like it's been a long time since I've been to Gay Pride, but the last time I was there, it felt a little bit like a, like a mall, and I felt like we were being swallowed by a capitalist machine to turn us into a into a palatable category. And uh, I really like I'm married with a man and mm -hmm. to a man, right? And uh, we we like to define our marriage through our own standards, and we like to sh be married and 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 then talk to other married couples who are straight, most of them, and tell them what marriage is to us. And uh, I think our the fact that we are different, the fact from the very root of the word queer, it's different. So. I, I believe that this whole like sort of didactic way of writing queer characters to to lecture people that we are just normal people. We are normal and we are like just human, but we also have a some of us we like to we have an opportunity to uh, redefine certain values or or just think certain structures differently. In my case, marriage, for example, and I like to write consciously about those things when I write gay gay gay, queer, trans characters? I think for me, uh, with Selena, um, coming into this project, it was very clear to me, and especially working uh, very closely with the family, that the storylines were gonna be very specific to their journey and their family, and they were gonna be approved you know, <laughs> by them in, in certain ways. So we had a very little sort of limited um, when it came to bringing queer characters or perhaps having a, you know, the representation that we would have wished. But uh, I took the opportunity to have such an iconic story um, be told by hiring, you know, following the footsteps of La Jefa here, Tania, uh, a Latinx um, room, mostly women and also over a third queer identifying. Uh, because if we are not allowed to perhaps because of the studio, whatever collaboration um, it's in place to put our queer stories there, there's gonna be a little bit behind the cameras if I can help it. And, uh, and I thought that that's a commitment. And so that's why I like to always, you know, start with that, that if perhaps we don't get to have a queer character because it wasn't approved or a studio or whatever, or it's not the story at hand, you know, I hope that behind the cameras, there are those creative forces that come out and say, we're queer and we did this too, you know? And I think that's just as important. Well, thank you. I, I couldn't agree more, obviously, right? Inclusion is so important. And and there's a little more, there's a little more, but I can tell you having been at EGLAD since 2008, it's growing very slowly. It's grown. I'm very happy to see the changes and a lot of you here have had to do with that change you've made it happen but it's it there's a lot more that we need there's not enough representation and i totally relate to marielle when she says you know with the first character you saw you still remember it i still remember the first film i saw where i was like i think maybe 
I think maybe they, they like each other in that way. I mean, I'm a little older than probably all of you, but um, it was just a shock to see that. And, and it was a maybe. I don't think it was certain until hour, you know, hour tw 120 in the film or something like that, that it was like, yes, they are. <laughs> but anyway, it's really, really important. And my job at GLAD is to push networks, studios, creators, producers, anybody who let me into their office to create more LGBTQ inclusive content in Espanol y en inglés para audiencias latinx, ¿no? So I'm excited for all that you do and keep going, please, 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 please. Whether they're good guys, bad guys, bad women, bad people, good people, whatever the character is, please keep going. Um, and I don't mean bad, I mean, you know, human. Um, how is your work shaped by being latinx, latina, latino, chilena, mexicana, mexican-american, however you identify? Do you think it's, it's shaped by your latinitud, so to speak? I go first again. Oh, sorry. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no. I forgot that I had to pick on people. <laughs> it has to shape me and my work in like a lot of ways. But what, what I enjoy the most is like these little details that come to mind when I'm writing. For example, the other day I was writing a scene that happens in, in a bar and I was like, no, 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 this should be a cantina. And then I just started feeling toques toques in my hands, no? <laughs> so, because I miss playing toques toques in the cantinas. And when I imagine someone cooking, I imagine my abuelos cooking in romeritos and going to the market with them and having a tortilla in my, my mouth. So that like, that, that shapes me, no? Like even, even when I imagine some character is going to walk through a street, I'm like, careful, because I grew up in Mexico City. So I'm like, you can get hit anytime. So all of that makes like a narrative, not in like this, only in these like huge macro gigantic ways, but only also in small details. And that, that's what I enjoy the, mo the most. I think when, when I, I thought about this question or, or thinking about this question, it's interesting because we're all Latinx, but the experience of each country is so different. Like an Argentinian Latino, it's a completely different. We have things in common. Most of Latin Latam has had dictatorships uh, pro propelled by the U.S. By the way, but we most, like many of us might have had like a, 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 an upbringing during these trying times, which. I was talking to a VP of a company and she said to me, well, your work, your work is very dark. And I thought, really? I thought I, I made like comedy and I realized there is something inside it, even if I'm doing comedy, that distills this darkness, we will say, or this, this view of life. But at the same time, it's a very different view that maybe, for example, Argentina now has a, uh, the abortion law. Chile only had their first abortion law in case of rape, dying of the mother or dying of the fetus, three years ago, three years ago, we don't have marriage equality. Argentina has marriage equality or Mexico has marriage equality. So it's such a different, like we all inhabit a different LATAM in a way. And for me, it's fascinating to see the different, different expression of this. Of course, Mexico, because they had their telenovelas, it came to all of us uh, since our childhood, so we kind of we kind of think we know more of Mexico than maybe they know of us. But yes, of course, also for me, I think this. I don't. I consider myself an optimist and a very bright person, but apparently in my work, there is some darkness that I'm not aware of, and I have to conclude, it has to come from being raised during a very dark time in the history of my country. I guess. Marcelo, no? I, I know I Your skipped. Turn, Marcelo. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, to, if I build up on, on that, I would say definitely thinking about our relationship to authority, for example, uh, our relationship to institutions, our suspicion of them, and uh, our sense of family and how, how, I don't know, amongst individuals we make life and we don't believe in government or, you know, it's, that's a very different life experience for all, for all of us as opposed to, I suppose, Anglo-Saxons. <laughs> Moises, <laughs> I think we've heard from everyone except Moises, maybe? No, Tania, Tania. Oh, Tania, Tania, perdón. Eh, last of the alphabet. 
Uh, I, I, I keep getting confused. It's like, are we doing last names or first names? Oh, I, uh, <laughs> I think I think for me, uh, there was like, I think different layers. I almost like organically discover intersectionality and I didn't even know. And they were like, now there's a word for it, right? But uh, I, you know, I was born and grew up in Mexico and uh, I got to the United States when I was 11 years old. So for me, growing up as a gay little boy with effeminate like sort of ways, it was a little difficult um, because you get picked on and you're not supposed to be like that. And then on, and then as soon as I get to, to the United States, I don't speak English. And then you're like being mistreated oh. because you're brown and who you are. So there's just like an additional layer. Uh, that you have to like, you know, uh, not be so obvious about, and and that and that type of thing taught me to create um, alternative universes, you know, in my mind and imagination and creativity were sort of an outlet for that, a form of catharsis and in a way that I could be myself. And uh, later in life, of course, it's like, oh, this is actually an occupation. This this is something I could do, and um, it's still kind of living this fantasy. But I mean, man, like it's it's difficult. It doesn't form a, a you know my 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 writing. I always think of identity and writing and, and worlds. But I, I there's still that sort of like need for validation, you know, um, whether it's parental or it comes from like my writing. And I think it also has to do with that really dire to be accepted for who you are and what you have to offer to the world. There's this commercial on Doritos about a Mexican boy and a, and a Mexican dad. And I'm like, oh, this is cute, this is great. And then like, boom, I'm like tearing up. And I'm like, wow, like it's still like, it's still, you know, after getting my, you know, uh, my life together and improving that I am worth it, it still kind of gets to me. And it's just, you know, and, I, and it, it makes me really happy that that kind of work is being put out there. Um, you know, I'm, I'm in London and, um, I'm writing a, a, I just, I wrote a piece about, that's what I came to do, um, about a Mexican, well, two Mexicans in London. And um, in my research, AKA just my being around people, there is no context for Mexicans here. Like I, like the first Uber driver that I got in, he was like, what do they speak in Mexico? What language do they speak? And I was like, huh. And then like um, somebody, <laughs> a Scottish person was like, what do you call the wee flat things? Tortillas? <laughs> like I was like oh my god I mean there's like 5,000 Mexicans uh, that's what the um embassy website says here and I was like this so but it's been um amazing because I am not a citizen of the United States I do have a green card but I'm so aware of that especially these past four years that there is a narrative of uh, Mexicanness, and I um sometimes I don't feel comfortable and sometimes I do calling Mex myself Mexican-American because um until they give me my give me my citizenship and then I can call myself American, you know, but, um, but um, I, as a Mexican American here hyphen it, cause they're like, well, your accent is American. Yes. But I met, you know, anyway, but um, it, it, it's so interesting looking at, at my Latinidad here, you know, because I'm so steeped in it over there. And there's such a negative connotation that you have to like every day kind of like, like fight against. And, and that's, that, that never happened to me in Mexico. It happens in the United States. They have a version of us that, you know, has um, been included or um, uh, the little bit that has been included for the past 120 years of, of the, in the industry of Hollywood, you know, which is like little cachitos of like thing. And it's like, wh what are the stereotypes? That's what we are, you know? So like, so I, when I get, and the, I get, used to get asked this in the theater all the time, oh, do you feel limited by being called a la Latina, um, you know, playwright and now, you know, creator. And I don't, cause like what they don't know is that we contain multitudes, you know, there's 27 countries that make up the Latin diaspora and our otherness is something that sure we have to wear there, but I'm never gonna run out of, of, of shit to write about. You know what I mean? Or, or, or shepherd. Right now I am starting a company. <laughs> 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 Ojalá that tells you everything. That, Ojalá que esto funcione. But, um, <laughs> I'm starting this company and, you know, I'm, start, I'm getting a slate going. It's all, you know, I, I have this, um, I've been very vocal about uh, no stories about us without us, you know, that's like my mantra. And, and it's just like, uh, and that, like, that's a, the North Star. And I feel like I'm never gonna run out of, of stuff to write about, you know? So like, um, um, because what, what, is, what is being, you know, Latina is a construct anyway. And I know that um, 
in case people come for us on Twitter, if they watch this, Latinidad is a, the term, it's a construct and it's under attack right now and they don't, they want us to get rid of it. You know, I get it. I understand all of it, but like, because we have no other umbrella term right now, I'm using it. Um, but, but it, yeah, it, it's also, it doesn't feel limiting. It feels expansive. Um, and and it's, it, it tells a lot about the people who ask you if you feel limited, uh, uh, you know, like executive, whatever, you know, people who, who ask you. Um, I, I'm, I'm proud of it, you know, and, and proud to put like, to center Latinidad and everything. Now, I am also defensive for like um, creators that um, don't have to deal with identity and their stuff and their Latina create, like def I defend that to death, but I do wanna, you know, like right now I'm shepherding this like queer Latina, um, queer from Me Mexican from Mexico City, um, a woman doing this like sci-fi thing, right? And the, the characters just happen to be like Latina, but I mean, but, and, and then the gaze is gonna be, because it's us, it's gonna be queer and Latina, but like, it doesn't, it, it also, I'm not gonna limit her to, um, to make an identity piece. You know what I mean? So like, I, I feel like um, we're in that moment to be like, to show you, look, we, we contain these multitudes of, of stories and narratives. Yay. <laughs> it's weird that they have reactions, right? We're like, oh. yes. <laughs> Gone! Gone! <laughs> <That's fine. laughs> <Connect. laughs> someone, someone mentioned this a few minutes ago that, that your work is now traveling and, and that's what's it's traveling more than ever, right? Because of Netflix and Pantalla and Amazon and I mean it's amazing. Novelas are great, novelas traveled a lot and novelas have changed. There have been more LGBTQ characters on novelas. And now we have a lot of your work that is going all over Latin America. That's just so exciting too, right? All, it, it can go everywhere now because of streaming platforms, not just in your own countries. So it's exciting. And so, so for depictions of LGBTQ people, also depictions of strong women, which a lot of you have, um, have helmed or written or created, which is wonderful too, because sexism, I mean, obviously, right? So many of the stories we still see in Spanish language media are the, the woman is the wife, you know, and that's her role is to be the wife and nothing wrong with being a wife, but when that's the only depiction, it's, it's not enough, right? But, but what you just said, it reminded me that one of you uh, said to me, I want to talk about, uh, I want to talk about this being silenced, uh, the way that our unique Latin American voices can be silenced because they sometimes don't seem to trust us to tell original stories. Um, is there a sort of layer, you kind of alluded to this a second ago, is there a layer then uh, for you of educating people about Latinx stories where you have to sort of explain the story and sell it more because it's a quote Latinx story? I have something to say about that, <laughs> just, from the, just from the Mexican experience, because it's a different thing when it comes to general market for Latinx in the US and us creating in Mexico or Latin America. And I will, I will put Fernanda as an example. She created in Amares, which will air, I believe, in May or something, uh, a, a female character that, had, that has three kids from three different men and two boyfriends and she doesn't want to choose either one of them and blah 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 it's a it's a different kind of female character for for mexican women and but for fernanda because i know i'm sorry to talk about you fair you i'll allow you to do the same for me <laughs> <laughs> but i know the story you know i i was with her i was directing it and for her, it was just like, well, I've seen women this way for a very, very long time. This is just a normal, just a, a Mexican woman that I know. But for that to happen, she needed a chief content officer who shielded her from, from, from certain notes, turning that character into a, a likable female character. And then she needed someone like Marcelo Tamburri at HBO Max to say, yes, we want to tell these stories. And that on like it really doesn't happen in Mexico. Like 95% of the times we are selling, even when we sell a, a series or when they commission us a series, we're getting these notes that are completely formulaic that turn our voices into formulas. And basically that's why you see most Spanish speaking content and it feels and looks and it, it, it just is like, a, like the small, like the small uh, brother of the American content or the British content, you know? It's like the, the B series of it. And it's not because we can't do original work, it's because they don't embrace our voices. They treat us like kids who don't know how to do it. Or, or maybe they think that the market 
uh, for Spanish speaking co content should be like a little bit tame and like a little bit telenovela. And we can't really do Game of Thrones because Mexicans or Latin Americans, they don't like watching Game of Thrones in Spanish, but they do watch Game of Thrones, right? So who's gonna let a Latino or a Latina do like the Game of Thrones with coyotes, flying coyotes or whatever? <laughs> so I think- My next project. No. Yeah, people watching this is, this is something we are a long way from getting embraced, uh, like our voices embraced in our difference and our capabilities of being original. Yeah, I, I saw an incredible Lucrecia Martel's interview. Uh, she talked about this like, yes, it's amazing to have all the streamings right now, but it also comes with a danger. You know? And the danger is then that they are. Um, homologando, I don't know how to say this in English, homologando all, 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 of the, uh, all of our voices, no? So it's the algorithm and then we go <laughs> and it's like, yeah, but we also have like amazing stories to tell. And we also are in the need of new narratives. When, when Marielle was uh, saying a, a while ago about everyone knowing about Mexico because of telenovelas, I built my Mexico because of telenovelas, no? So I was like, damn, I'm, I'm, I'm a lesbian, so I'm not there. And damn, like, yeah, my, I should go and marry and like look for this huge iglesia so I can have a happy ending, no? So that, that also happened to me, even if that wasn't my, my reality, no? So what it's happening now and what, what I think is the danger in LATAM with all of these streamings is that if we don't empower voices, and that's why I think what Tania is doing with all the, the uh, incubadora is so, so, so important because we have to empower cre creators, not an algorithm. And we have to walk that path because if we keep on going with this, like, oh no, the algorithm says, the creators are not going to, to have their chance to tell their own stories, whatever those stories are. I think there's a little, some, there's some similarities here. Um, if you don't find a champion, with Marcelo, you were talking about uh, um, Peru being championed. If you don't find a champion, you're fucked. Cause there is a formula or their identity, like they wanna hear, hear <laughs> here, no, over there in the United States. Uh, they wanna hear um, these like, the poor immigrant is coming or the maid or the M M M13, like uh, whatever, like they want, they have these. And then when you come and you just like bring them like a lawyer that it's a fetishist, they're like, wait, what? You know, that's that those stories are for white people. You know, th those are not your stories. You know what I mean? They're like, why? I would like to be a fetishist, you know? Um, I am a fetishist. No, <laughs> 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 um, it, it's, it's so, it, I, I, and I always talk about her and it's like a drinking game, but um, um, Marta Fernandez was at Stars. And that's who, like, I had only been in Hollywood three years. I didn't really know what I was doing. And she gave me a show. She took, Fernandez is the key. That's the last name. Now, it's Espanol. <laughs> we forgive her though, because she got it, right? <laughs> We're still brethren. She was, she was hermana. And she defended and championed me in every way, all the stuff, not just all Latina directors all Latina uh, um, writers room, um, mostly queer, like uh, whatever, every, everybody, all the department um, had female, like that, you need a champion or it doesn't happen. Like, because you're, you know what I mean? And so like, that's, that's the key. And right now I'm in a new home and I'm trying to figure out if that's how it's going. So this second, ox, oxifamor, oxif, the second effort I'm about to have who knows what's going to happen? Because I don't know. Do I have a champion? Because you're right. It's like, because uh, that's a person who's fighting those fights inside the castle that you don't even know about. That you're yeah. like, you know yeah. what I mean? That person is so key. And we don't have enough of those people in there. You know, they get it. That they, they don't want to like, you know, all the things that you said, like hom homogenize. And, and this is an invitation for them to exist, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Please exist because great shows will come out of that. Yeah because Latin America and the Mexican American experience and the Latino experience in the US is so rich with story. Yes, 
in my case with, with Amaya and Fidela, uh, the two executives from Dopamine, it was the first time or one of the first times in my whole career, like 12 years, that someone told me, what do you think about this note? And I was like, what? <laughs> I don't have to like do it right now <laughs> because that's the way LATAM works, no? Like, okay, this is shit. You should write this, 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 this. And you start turning, like I, I, I used to have this like voiceover in my head who were like, Eh, productores mexicanos <laughs> so, uh, like no no they're not going to like this and it was the first time that I felt free to write this story so it's like very very important please people <laughs> do it I, I have an Argentine um, and one of my executives at Universal Content it's very exciting um, like to me to be working with her you know because it's like it feels like okay but let's, but you know, I, we haven't like made a show yet, so I don't know how it's going to play out, but um, it, it's it, when we find each other in the castle, I know I keep talking about the castle, but when we find each other, it's like, you, you got to kind of hold on because it's, um, there's not that many of us, you know? Yeah. And it, I think to, to, to their point is the quality of the conversation improves when you have someone on the other side of the table that understands, even if it's a person of color, that understands the different layers that you have to deal with there isn't a conversation about being of color. There's a conversation of like the character. Okay, I got that stuff. We got that intersectionality. Now can we move on to their what their wants, to their drives, to something that actually just pushes the boundaries of your storytelling. And I found myself, and I've been pitching this past fall, a couple of shows, you know, over 20 pitches with a bunch of executives. And I found myself having those kind of conversations when there was at least one person of color on the executive side that like actually pushed the project to be something and asked me the right questions where before they were like well uh, uh, you you can't explain race or 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 queerness to someone that you know that is not coming from that kind of same point of view because it's just it only is a 40 minute I mean, so it really does help. And, and it is one of those things that I am learning to, like Tanya said, to latch on to that. Even if it doesn't work out with those executives, just, just always go back and be like, how are you doing? How's everything? How can I help? And I think that's really uh, important if you want to take over the castle. <laughs> we will, people. We'll take over we the castle. <laughs> we will. I Throw think it's very interesting what, what Tanya said that inside this Latinx identity, there are millions ways to be. And sometimes you feel like in the US or in Europe, but more in the US, they have this way of seeing Latinx. And it's impressive because you said, oh, this is a story that a white people can live. And it happened with me with my first movie, Young and Wild, which is about an bisexual girl that wants to fuck around. <laughs> Just that and she's, understanding herself from a very conservative religious family. But then I tried to turn it into a series and for them it, it was weird. Like it, it didn't, it was 2012. So it's like, what? Like, what is this a Latina person? It, for them, it was a white person, American story and they couldn't place it in a, anywhere in the Latino community in their minds. So they're missing out in so many stories, characters, and creativity, of course. Agreed. So it's an interesting uh, film. And um, it, within an evangelical family, she definitely is a very, you know, mm -hmm. expressive of her sexuality. It's fantastic. Within these confines of that very evangelical family, which I found fascinating. I was going to ask you a question about your film, but you already talked about it. And I think we're running out of time. So I'm going to give you all like, like a triple whammy of a question. <laughs> Oh, I also want to say for anyone watching this, you all need to be evangelist, evangelical and watch the shows of the people who are on here. Talk about it. Tweet about it. Get on it. Let's be great, a great fan base. That's my glad commercial. I have to get that in because it's important, right? We make great content. Watch it. Share it. Talk about it. Write about it. Go crazy, right? So anybody watching, that's your job. You got the, that's your job. Okay. What, what are you most excited about as a creator right now that you're working on or what do you want to create? And then what words of advice would you have for aspiring writers 
or directors? I know it's a lot, but you can choose from any of them because I don't want us to run out of time and not let you sort of share this wisdom. Peru. <laughs> I'm working and on a couple of young adult uh, projects. And as Maria Lee was saying, I, I love those kind, kinds of projects because I grew up needing them. And I grew up super sad, feeling uh, like very, very abnormal and very lonely and very like sad <laughs> for real. And I think that can save, sli that, that can save lives. For, for a lot of people, it's game changing. So I'm, I'm creating two new projects that have to do with like a, a queer, that have queer characters that also have like different kinds of like watching the world and being different and being proud of being different. So I really enjoy that. that. And to people that are aspiring to, to get into this industry, just like talk to us. Like we're, I'm really like searching to give opportunities to work with new people, hearing new voices. And we are trying to do this like new concept of, not new concept, but like holding the door. We're always talking about, okay, let's hold the door and pasenle todos, no? That's what I really, really want to do. <laughs> so, <laughs> and like resumes and samples and everything and, and we'll try to help you sell that series and or get on that show. I second that. I think it's really, really important. I was given an opportunity early on by people of color that were queer and, and Latinx and black. And so like, I am trying to pass on that opportunity as well. And also just to, you know, I'm excited about the projects that again, my focus is definitely Latinx, Afro-Latino and indigenous storytelling from like kind of what I know, uh, but all genres. But I, you know, just to tell all those emerging writers, especially that, you know, are in, live in the intersectionality of Latinx and queerness is to work on your craft, find your crew, your posse, your friends, anyone that could support you, but also take care of yourself. Like mental health is really, really important. This is not an easy business. You're going to get a lot of no's. So you need to take care of that and then come and find us. <laughs> well, I'll jump in. I'm um, just... Building up on, on what Moises said, I think, yeah, you also need to find and nurture your voice because that's the only thing that you have to actually sell in a way that makes you unique in this business. And uh, my recommendation would be to do what I did. Uh, nobody really opened the door to me when I was, I made my first film when I was 27 years old and I completely self-financed, micro-budget. And then I thought, well, I put it on cinemas, it went to festivals, and then I thought, okay, that's gonna open the door to me because I proved that I could self-finance a film and then it was on cinemas. Seven years later, I, I hadn't shot a single frame of film. So I eventually, I think what got me here in this panel is that I made a film with, my, with an iPhone, <laughs> which went around the world. And it was like $15,000, which is a lot to some people, but today it is very cheap. You can make a film very, very cheap, cheaply and it can be at the same level of quality as any other film in the same in, at Sundance, you know, Sundance Film Festival. So what better way to show people what you can do and to prove to yourself what you can do and what you want to say without any filters than creating your own content. And I, you can, everything is on the internet, go ahead and do it. Just to build on what Marcelo is saying, also, I always say this to queer creators, I think we're blessed, it's painful, especially the ones that we are older because we grew up with no reference, referentes, I don't know how to say it in English. So you felt like a Martian, but I think that was a blessing at least for me because I keep thinking, they say men and women, this doesn't make sense to me. So it made me question everything around me from an early age, everything they put you in, in here, you need to question. And this point of view, maybe straight people don't arrive to something that changed them until very late in their life. So you need to know that this, that can seem as a weakness or, or something painful is your biggest strength. So you can build on that because you are special for this and you have a point of view that 
not many people have. So um, aprovechalo. I don't know how to say it in English. And of course, take find advantage people, of it. Take advantage. And of course, find people like everyone that is here in this panel because we know how difficult it is. And if we can, we're going to open the door for all the rest because it's the only way to go. Opening the door is very much um, part of the mission for me too. Um, I, okay, I know I have like a minute, right? Um, no, writing no. is a verb. People have to write. You don't have to be like a professional writer to be a writer, but writing is a verb so that your voice is undeniable. You, 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 gotta, you gotta be ready and your voice has to be undeniable. You have to be like, oh, that's a Zamora or that's a Tobar, that, you know, like that's a Saracho. Like, oh, there's, there's nobody else who can do that thing. That's like, the, that doesn't, um, you don't have to be professional for that. You just have to keep doing it. And that's what uh, Marcelo was saying. Um, and uh, my two projects that I'm like most excited about right now are Love Story, the thing that I'm finishing. It's super hetero, I'm sorry. That's just how it came. And, um, but they, they need love too. Um, and um, <laughs> um, Brujas, which is gonna be like, so I'm gonna, trying to decolonize magic um, and, and it's gonna be queer, it's gonna be amazing. And, uh, but yeah, anyway, those are the two projects. Beautiful, beautiful. I think we are almost out of time. I love you all. I know, I know, I know. We're almost out of time, but I, we could keep going and going and going and going. Um, thank you for your generosity, for your talent, for your wonderful spirit, for sharing your thoughts and ideas today and for being with us. Los amo, les amo a todos y todas y todos. Y quiero que sigan adelante. Oh, ¿hay algún mensaje en español para la gente que nos está mirando en español? Rapidito. Sí se puede. Gracias, Mónica, y gracias a todos por organizar esto. Gracias. Gracias. ¿Qué, ¿Qué fue? Chao, chao. Chao, chao.